Welcome to Talking Point with Stephen Taylor. It's good to have you along and thank you for joining us uh, in a brand new year, 2018. Happy New Year to you and yours. And uh, ah, I know that it's going to be a good year, man. Uh, today we have a very interesting and special guest joining us today. Uh, the man himself, Mr. Dave Thompson. But uh, he was also somebody else, quite purple. Mm, not Prince, no Purple Rain, I don't know. Dave, how are you, buddy? Hi. Good to have you yeah. here, man. <laughs> thank you, happy new year, great to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us. All the way from the UK, first time in, in Cape Town. Yep. Um, you've been to South Africa before, to Johannesburg, right? Yeah. But so never actually to, to not Cape, to Cape Town. Town. Yeah. I, so I tell I us about your experience so far. Well, um, the last time or this time? <laughs> well, yeah, both. Well, so, uh, seven years ago, I came to Joburg and uh, I did uh, Joe Parker's Comedy Club oh, yeah. and a casino somewhere nearby as well, yeah. doing stand-up comedy, uh, which was really enjoyable. And this time I came out again and did Joe Parker's Comedy Club again and also Goliath Comedy Club. And then I flew down from Joburg to Cape Town and this is my first time in this beautiful city. But you haven't, have you seen any of the, the landmarks or anything like that? Have you been to the waterfront or? Yeah, I've been to the waterfront okay. because I've been headlining the Cape Town Comedy Club. Oh yeah, that's right, that's there, right. Which yeah. is a really great room, lovely club. It's a great venue. Yeah, they yeah. look after their acts very well. They and do. the building is beautiful. I think it's one of the oldest buildings in Cape Town. It is, it was the old pump house. Yeah, it's yeah. an old pump house and, and you can see the old granite rocks that it's made from, which could even possibly have come in the, as a ballast in a ship. Because yeah. a, a long time ago, they would, uh, you know, the old sailing ships, they put all this local stone into the, the bottom by the keel to sort of give it ballast. And then when they got to the place where they were going, they'd sometimes then be loading a cargo. So they would take the old stones out and dump them on the quayside. Sure. So you could sometimes find that, you know, you could be in Scotland and there would be piles of coral that had come from the Pacific or the Caribbean. And you could be in South uh, Africa and there might be piles of granite from... Cornwall or Scotland or somewhere. Are you also a geography teacher? No, um, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, I'm like, what? What's going on? <laughs> Am I interviewing my geography teacher? <laughs> what, what happened? Anyway, no, I'm only teasing. It's man. a beautiful. It's a love. It's a lovely old building. It is. But I've seen Table Mountain, and I like the way that they let you know it's supper time because they put a nice fluffy white tablecloth on the top. That's right. But I heard yeah. that they that actually Table Mountain was going to be a lot higher. But really? uh, they couldn't get the planning permission to go above a certain height, so they had to suddenly stop building. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to I have to go back um, to when I was growing up, to when I was a a, a young a young man. Not that I'm not that young anymore. But Probably anyway. younger than me. Yeah, but just a little bit. <laughs> um, Teletubbies. Yeah. I I grew up watching that, and that was one of my my favorite shows growing up. Even now, some people will like say no they never watched that but I, I Stephen Taylor can say that I did watch the Teletubbies and I was a fan um, I never did really because you were in it <laughs> you were there yeah um, Tinky Winky the purple Teletubby mm -hmm. tell us about that experience and how that all came about well uh, there's a very famous TV comedian in Britain called Harry Hill who's like one of the big main primetime Saturday night TV stars and his first ever series was um, called Harry Hill's Fruit Fancies. And I played various characters in his show. And one of them was an Egyptian mummy. All right. And the costume lady actually had to sew the bandages over my face. Oh, wow. And I couldn't come out again until she came and snipped the stitches and took the bandages off. That's quite hectic. Yeah, and people said to me, don't you feel uh, claustrophobic, you know, being in this uh, thing? And I said, no, I feel quite secure and safe in here. Maybe I'm a little bit autistic. Oh. And the guy who was working on the ru as a runner on that show uh, went up the ladder in the TV world and became the production manager for the Teletubbies. Sure. And when they were casting it, he remembered me and how I liked being in the costume uh, of this Egyptian mummy and he gave me a call and said you want to come and audition that's really cool and they auditioned over 600 people for the part of Tinky Winky wow and I got the part the purple Teddy Tubby, I think that's one of the most famous ones out of all of them. Well, I think when they sing the song, you know, Tinky Winky, Dipsy, yeah. he's the first one they sing. He is. And I think he's the most notorious one uh, because there's been most controversy over the character. There has been. Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, the gay element of that. Yeah. And somebody said to me the other day, Stephen, but how can a kiddies TV show like the Teddy Tubbies, children watching, they don't know right or wrong, they don't know mm. gay or not gay. Does it really matter? 
Does yeah. it really matter? Well, it doesn't because um, the, the Teletubbies are aimed for children from yeah. the age of being a baby yeah. up to about three. Yeah. And obviously children need to have their childhood and they are pre-sexual beings mm. and so the Teletubbies are these uh, sexless characters. Yeah. Uh, they have gender. Uh, Poe and Lala are female, okay. and Tinky Winky and Dipsy are male, okay. but they uh, don't have sexuality or genitals. Uh, but what happened with the Tinky Winky thing was that uh, they'd show the show very early in the morning, like about six o'clock in the morning, because uh, people with very young children, they often, when they're trying to get ready in the morning, they need um, uh, something to occupy yeah, the children. Yeah, to stimulate the children. Yeah. yeah, so if they can stick the kids in front of the TV set and know that they're just going to stay riveted to the screen, they can get on with, you know, washing yeah, their hair or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so they showed it very early in the morning. But what happened was that people would come back from nightclubs uh, having, you know, been raving and taking various uh, substances. Yeah. And they'd come back to the house to chill out and they turned the TV on and they saw the telly yeah. And it suddenly became this sort of cult program amongst the sort of drug taking students and ravers. That's hectic. And then apparently uh, in uh, San Francisco, the gay community adopted Tinky Winky as a sort of a gay mascot because he has the red handbag, or purse, as they say in America. Yeah, I was going to ask you where your handbag was, man. Yeah, well... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he left it in Britain. Uh, it's, yeah, it's still, they've still got it. <laughs> and um, he's also purple, which is a po supposedly a gay colour. Yeah. And he has a triangular aerial, which is supposedly a gay symbol. So uh, they sort of adopted him. And then the born-again Christian preacher, Jerry Falwell, in America, uh, denounced Tinky Winky as being gay. Sure. Uh, and that's when the whole thing came about. Yeah. And in Poland, um, they tried to ban the program. Wow. Because uh, there's a very sort of anti gay lobby in Poland. And they said that it was, you know, sort of espousing gayness and yeah. therefore it should be banned. Um, and in Kazakhstan, the Teletub is, is banned wow. by personal order of the president wow. on the grounds that Tinky Winky is a sexual pervert. That's hectic. Wow. Yeah. But Teletub has had a big reach and um, so many people watched it. Yeah, um, not in Kazakhstan. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but from from north to three, I don't know. I think I watched it when I was much older than that. I think uh, maybe in my early teens, but that's okay because yeah. I think you know there's no age limit to watching no. a show like that. And uh, you were probably the one of the only Teletubbies that got free Wi-Fi with the antenna um, back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, the triangular aerial was better, yeah, then. yeah. I could get the can sports I, can channels. Can we get Wi-Fi? Yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> so did that. Um, kind of help your career at that time? Um, it got a huge amount of publicity, yeah, because the show was shown all over the world and it's still now massively famous. It's still it, shown. Yeah, because yeah. there's an endless supply of babies to watch yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. So they can just recycle it, like where our Seinfeld, even a Seinfeld fan, there's only so many times they want to watch the sitcom episodes. That's right. But with the Teletubbies, endless supply of babies, uh, and then different countries can put their own soundtrack onto it oh. because the Teletubbies transcend race. Yeah. So it's shown in Japan, India, Indonesia, sure. Iran, uh, America, The, the shows Australia. that you did, the repeats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, so um, it, it, any country you go to, you just have to say Teletubby Stinky Winky and everybody immediately know, knows it. But I mean, are you still getting royalties for that? Or Unfortunately, no. Really? No, I don't get royalties. Does I that probably not should work? do. But yeah. Since the BBC had problems with their license and everything, it's probably never got through. Oh, wow. Yeah. At so one you time can't I challenge to, that? Well, I, at one time I used to get money literally just pouring into my bank account. Yeah. And then it slowed down. And it sort of came went down to a trickle. And right. every so often I'd phone the BBC up and I'd say, shouldn't you be sending me some money? Yeah. And then suddenly a few thousand pounds would appear in my account. Maybe I should phone them again. Well, <laughs> then it got to the point where I phoned them up to say, you know, I think I should have some money. Yeah. And I was obviously talking to an unpaid intern. Oh. And they sent me to somebody else and that people didn't know, you know, anything about it. And, um, and they put me onto somebody else and then they say, oh no, you need to speak to a different department. And I got passed around. Oh. until about 45 minutes later Jeez. somebody put me through to another person and I started saying I'm the guy who was in the Tinky Winky yeah. costume and the guy said let me stop you there you're the first person I 
spoke to you when you first made the call. Uh, and I'd gone round in a big circle. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't get any money. Well, maybe let's try again. I think it's a HR or yeah. HR. Payroll. I don't know. Yeah, they 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 put it out to a private company. That's what okay. the problem is. Okay. Yeah. But I'm sure you must follow it up. They must if they are repeating it, then they should be. You should be getting. Um, I should. Yeah, rewarded for that. I mean, when when uh, we were given the contract, we should have been given equity contracts, which would cover all the foreign sales. And if they'd done that, I would be now very rich. Yeah. Uh, but um, they didn't. They ripped us off on the contract, and it was a worldwide and video buyout. Sure. So we got repeat fees on the showings in UK TV, and we got some stuff for outside, but not very much. Mm. Um, but they're so strict now with the contracts. If you do a TV show now, the contract says that um, the money they pay you, the one-off fee, not only covers the whole world, but all civilizations yet to be discovered. Jeez. So if, people, if, if they discover life on another planet and they sell the <laughs> TV show to them, they don't have to actually pay you any more money. Wow. Yeah. That's hectic. Mm. So tell me about your career as a whole. Um, you are a comedian. Yeah. You aren't only Tinky Winky. That wasn't your only thing that you did. No. You are a comedian. Um, tell us about tell us about your your career in comedy and how that came about. Well, uh, I went to college um, with Ben Elton, who is a sort of a fairly worldwide uh, well-known person. Yeah. He's a comedian and writer. He's best known, I think, for co-writing the Black Adder sitcom. Um, <clears throat> he's also written a lot of novels and he was at one time one of the top stand-up comedians in Britain mm. and also in the Australia and places and um, he became a comedian when we were very young and I saw him you know become famous on TV and I always like to make people laugh so I thought well I'll try doing comedy uh, I've done a degree in theatre and I wanted to be something in showbiz and uh, doing stand-up comedy is a really great way to get started because it's just one person yeah. with their own material going into a place uh, you don't have to organize other people yeah um, so it's a very uh, low production value mm. um, medium and uh, a lot of people then went on become big famous comedians and then became you know panel show uh, participants or hosts and actors and stuff mm. but so it's hard this industry is hard it's hard. The entertainment it's, industry as a whole is, yeah. is hard and it's getting even harder. It's always been hard, but it's much harder now than yeah. it was uh, when I started, yeah. Tell us about some of the people um, that you've worked with or know, or maybe I hear that you sell comedy as well to people. Well, we all have to diversify, and uh, I have an ex-wife and two little daughters in mm. Budapest in Hungary, so I run a comedy show once a month in, in Budapest so that I can sort of employ myself to host <laughs> the show. And I you know, fly comedians there every yeah. month. Oh, wow. But uh, when I was quite early in my stand-up career, I was booked to do a restaurant in Hampstead, which is a sort of a rich suburb mm. of, of London. Mm. And um, it was uh, owned by a guy uh, who decided he wanted to put stand-up comedy on in his restaurant. And when I got there, this guy met me, a very young guy, and he said, hi, I'm Sasha, my uncle owns a restaurant. And he asked me to sort of be here to look after you. And he took me down to a sort of an unused little part of the restaurant in the basement and he offered to make me a cup of tea and stuff and as i was getting changed into my suit ready for the show he st st stayed around and he was asking questions about being a comedian sure and i said to him it sounds to me like you want to become a comedian yeah. yourself he said well yeah. i'm thinking about trying sure his name's sasha baron cohen oh my goodness really <laughs> yeah <laughs> he went on to become borat and do you still you. speak to him I haven't spoken to him for a while, but okay. we did work with each other after that a few times. I love that a guy. TV show I'm like a, this. I'm a fan of that guy. Yeah, but he's Yo. a you know, comic genius. That's hectic. And that's just one of many people who I've uh, worked with. So he didn't know anything about comedy then? He, it, he was just a very young guy who, who you know, had aspirations to try to go into show business. Yeah. And if you look at him then and if you look at him now, he's completely different, right? He oh, yes. Yeah. I think he's got you a wouldn't recognize him in the street, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you might recognize him. He'd look a lot younger, but... Mm. Um, yeah, you know, he, he, he's the same guy. Wow. Mm. Is that a real name? Sasha Baron Sasha Cohen? Baron Cohen is oh, wow. his real name, yeah. Okay. And his uncle actually does own a restaurant? Yeah. Oh, mm. that's hectic. Yeah. And tell us about some of the other people that you've, that you've worked with or, yeah. Um, I remember one time I was um, getting a train back to the south coast of England from London where I live and there was a theatre across the road where they had the Rod Stewart musical which was written by Ben Elton, my friend Ben Elton. Sure. And I was also friends with the producer of, of the whole musical. 
and uh, I missed a train and I had about another half hour before the next train and I thought oh, I'll phone Phil up my friend who yeah. produces because he might be across the road in the theatre yeah so I phoned him up and said you know you're around he said yeah come over for a drink so I went over to the Victoria Theatre the Victoria Palace Theatre where the show was and got shown into a little VIP suite and there was my friend Phil and Rod Stewart sitting in the Gosh, VIP room. You're. So I was introduced to Rod Stewart and we just sat there drinking. That's hectic. And he likes tartan because he's originally Scottish. Oh. And I was wearing a Levi shirt, like a sort of a lumberjack type shirt that was a sort of reddish tartan. And Rod Stewart said, hey, I love your shirt. <laughs> he said, I might make uh, you an offer you can't refuse for that shirt. Can I wow. try it on? Wow. So I took my shirt off and Rod Stewart tried it on. But unfortunately, it was much too big for him, oh. so he didn't buy it off me. Oh. <laughs> but tell me about the you you sell comedy as well to people. Uh, how does that work, and who have you who have you worked with on that? Well, sometimes uh, people who are really famous, you know, celebrities, TV comedians, they see me performing and they say, "Hey, that joke of yours, I'd like to buy it because I yeah. think it's a brilliant joke." So I then sell the joke to them, and uh, I've written quite a few jokes which I've sold to some big famous people. Can you mention any of them? Well one of them is Omid Jalili who is a brilliant stand-up comedian yeah. and also a very good actor. He yeah. was in The Mummy, Yeah. Um, he was in Mr. Nice about yes. Howard Marks playing yes. the crooked accountant. He's done loads of, of films um, and he bought a joke off me and then Stuart Lee who's one of the top British comedians he bought a joke off me and I've also written for some other people as a commissioned writer. Sure. And I hear that you've got a book out at the moment as well. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, I, I wrote a novel uh, mm. because I, I always aspired. I love novels. It's one of my favorite uh, media, or mediums. I'm yeah. quite sure what the Do you read a lot of books? I used to read a lot of books okay. before I had children. Um, yeah. I d read a lot when on the Teletubbies set because any, um, any filming involves lots of lying around waiting That's right. for them to set the cameras up. That's right. And I was reading about a novel a day on the Teletubbies. But I wrote a novel called The Sex Life of a Comedian, which is um, a mythologization of my own career. Wow. It's about a stand-up comedian on the comedy circuit who gets a job wearing a blue furry costume <laughs> in a, a world-famous TV show. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a novel, it's a fictitious story, so nobody can sue me. Yeah. And there are some true things in there, but there are lots of made-up things as well. All right. Because uh, there's a very close connection between organized crime and show business and so I sort of exaggerate that in the novel uh, I've, I've worked for the Mafia in the past oh wow yeah not knowingly I didn't sort of think hey I fancy doing some gigs for the Mafia <laughs> <laughs> is that real or part of the book I'm getting it's a bit worried now part of the book but okay. in, all, in reality I have also worked for um, yeah people who were organized criminals it's not unknown for if because if often if you're performing comedy you're yeah. in a nightclub yeah. and nightclubs obviously no no, no I understand yeah, yeah. so uh, it's not unknown for people to say would you like me to pay you in cocaine yeah uh, oh. an offer I've never accepted I hasten to add good although there was one very famous uh, British comedian who I shouldn't really say his name <laughs> but he Probably did a, he did a whole series of TV commercials for a very famous uh, company, yeah. I won't say their name either. No. And it's quite well known in the business that he was paid it with a hundred thousand pounds worth of cocaine. Wow. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, he's dead now. Well, there we go. Yeah. It was wasn't good cocaine then. It, well, I think it was too good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So people can get your book. Where can they buy your book? They can, can buy they? it online. Uh, from Amazon. Okay. Uh, it's available for Amazon Kindle. Um, uh, it's called The Sex Life of a Comedian by Dave Thompson. And they can also buy it from lulu.com uh, and they can get a hard copy. Uh, Is that a new Teddy Tubby? Uh, <laughs> Lulu. <laughs> I think it's a. Uh, it's <laughs> Thank you, Enki Dipsy, Lala Poet. <laughs> Lulu, as opposed to Nunu. It would be, it would be, it would fit in, right? <laughs> If you remember the Nunu, you remember how the Nunu's hose only ever bent one way? Yes. That's because it was a guy in there with his arm through the hose. Was that like, like the weird vacuum cleaner? Yeah, thing, and though? he could only bend his arm. I remember arm. that, oh my goodness. Yeah, the elbow would only bend one way, so <laughs> yeah. that's why the hose only <laughs> goes one way. Okay. That was fun, man. Did you enjoy it on set? Was it a lot of fun? It was a sort of a euphoric atmosphere Isn't in the it? early days. 
because we knew it was going to be a big success. Yeah. Because the company who made the show, they were very, very clever, and they'd made several t t children's TV shows before that. All right. Um, the, the reason that the, the main woman, the owner, um, who, and the Teletubbies made her the second richest woman in Britain after the Queen. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah, until J.K. Rowling took over yeah. after the Harry Potter thing. <laughs> yeah. She then knocked her down to third position. Yeah. But um, uh, she was working on a, a breakfast TV show called TV AM and uh, they had falling ratings and so what uh, she had the idea of getting a little puppet and they got this puppet called Roland Rat mm. uh, to sort of be in this show even though it was a, a breakfast show for a, adult people and what they discovered was that their ratings suddenly shot through the ceiling oh. because a lot of the adults who were getting ready for, for work and had breakfast TV on had very young children and Roland Rat engaged the children and so they then knew that if they had CVAM on, the, um, the children would watch the program because of Roland Rat. Sure. And, and hence the ratings went up. And so she took that knowledge and went into making TV programs for very young children using little cuddly characters. Wow. Um, and so she made programs, one called Brum, about a, a, a car. Uh, which was huge in Japan. She made uh, Tots TV with these little children and she made uh, little yeah. characters. Yeah. And then she made another one called Rosie and Jim, which were about these little um, rag dolls that lived on a, a narrow boat, which is like a little barge for the canals in Britain. And they learned, every time they made a show, they learned from the experience of making them. Sure. And they were selling them all over the world. They made a lot of money. So the Teletubbies was their big project. And what they used to do, they, they used to sponsor nurseries and creches for very young children in all the different parts of the UK. And they would make sure that they have them in every area for rich people, poor people, different uh, ethnic areas. Yeah. And the deal that they had with these nurseries was that in return for giving them money, they would be able to show their preview tapes as they then were, uh, to the children with a camera on top of the TV set filming the children. Oh, and their reaction. Yeah. yeah. And we went as part of the sort of training process for the Teletubbies, we were shown these tapes and we saw one where you could see that all these little tiny children sitting on the floor in front of the TV set, but then after a while one of them drifted away and then a couple of others got a bit distracted. Yeah. And then they had another one they showed us where all the kids were riveted to the screen right the way through. Sure. And they knew that if that happened with every preview tape they sent out to yeah. every nursery, yeah they knew that it was a given, 100% certainty, that when they transmitted it, it was going to be a massive hit. That's hectic. Yeah. So tell me, Dave, um, you've, your first time to, to Cape Town, uh, you've done shows here. Can we expect you back to South Africa? Well, I hope so. Uh, I mean, I came here to escape the British winter yeah. because January is a very uh, unpleasant cold. month in, yeah. in England. And I'm a hot weather guy. Uh, and I'm also obsessed with Africa. I love Africa. I've been to Senegal, the Gambia, Tanzania, um, Kenya. Even though it's a boop old country, anywhere. Which one? Oh, that's what you mean, yeah. yeah. It's a Donald Trump. Yes, yeah. well, you know, well, let's I, not give that guy any credit on this show. Yeah, I don't listen to him. Yeah. <laughs> I've also been to um, North Africa, Egypt, um, yeah. Morocco, um, Tunisia. I have some shows in Morocco coming up soon. Oh wow! I've performed in Egypt already, and I did um, also. I've done Dar es Salaam, did a corporate the show there. Egyptian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> most of the people in the audience were um, they were fat Europeans covered oh, wow. in gold. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, so any excuse to come to Africa, I love. And um, no, we must get you back. I would you love to come, come back. back here. Yeah. 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 Dave Thompson, thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. It's been a thank pleasure, you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank having you. me on the show. Uh, another great episode of Talking Point with Stephen Taylor. Of course, uh, connect with me on uh, Facebook uh, and Twitter at Stephen Taylor Essay. Uh, catch you back next week, same time, same place. God bless.